from the time Tommy was a kid, there was never any question. Tommy always wanted to be a fisherman. He used to go to the wharf with his father when he was five and six years old. When he was a little kid, he used to steal fish and take it and sell it before he went to school so he'd have money for dance on the weekend. You know, 10, 11 years old, 12 years old. Times have changed so much. He never even had any, any kind of thought about anything else. He just wanted to be a fisherman. Whereas my kids aren't like that. I don't believe there's any fisherman that doesn't really love the ocean, love the sea. Even old fishermen, my father-in-law, for one, was retired for 10 years, and he still always talks about he's going to make one more trip, or he's going to make one more trip. You know, they love it. Tommy says he hates fishing, but I know he doesn't. There's, there's nothing that he'd rather do. You know, we've talked about it before and discussed getting his shore job, and he said that he doesn't think he could handle a shore job. Because even though I'll say you have to work a, around the clock, you're really more or less pretty much your own boss as long as you do your job. What? Yeah. You want a case of note down the Mind. I'll cross that game. One hit, that's it. Hey, man, I'll bet. I'll set if you are. Yeah, you'll pick up the standards very first. How about Bob? Yeah, we'll pick Thank up Bob. Okay, then. Yeah, just right. Just bring yourself up a little bit.
you can't just go down to the wharf and talk to a skipper and say, can I go fishing? They don't take you that way. For the first time, most of the time, if you do get someone that will take you, it's probably an uncle or a relative or your father or whatever. And then you go for half a share if the crew and the skipper think you're worth that. If you're not worth that half share, you don't get that half share. They decide amongst themselves what you're worth. Then if they decide that you're really worth the whole thing, the guys can get together. If they like the way you work, they could give you a full share your first time out. And then they could take you for one time and you could never go again. It's going to take us uh, 10 days to get a trip like this. Oh, slow pickings right now. Some guys, they won't come in until they get a trip. Oh, they got the luck. They need a lot of luck this right today. I always say to Holy Family, he goes out and he always gets on a car where he's lucky. He's lucky. lucky. Look at how many skippers. They buy their own boats and they go back home. They take other guys' boats on it. They, they make a good oh. living. Ooh, got 27 days. One trip. In 27 days, I come home. We could share up a dime. We wanted the whole. In fact, the skipper wanted us to pay $100 a piece. Who was that? I said, you, must get it. I said, you must be crazy. After 27 days, I'm going to pay you. Seven thousand of that. You can't even pay for the oil if that's all you can catch. You don't care. Time's almost up. 
I gotta go another 25 years. Couple years, I'll be all done. Now. I don't know it. I gotta go 25. Give it all to me. You give me your boat. I'll leave it all to you. And I send you a haddock to Florida once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> He was taught being a great father. His father was from uh, Newfoundland. He came here when he was about nine, I think. And he fished from the time he was 11 years old. His father used to fish on the old schooners. Just compasses, no radar, no fish finders. You know, he, he, he fished the real old way, the hard way. And Tommy learned a lot from his father. He learned to mend from his father. I'm sure he picked up things from other fishermen. But mainly it was his father's influence. When they walk in that door, <laughs> oh. and they have a beard, <laughs> and you see yeah. nothing, you're just so happy to see them. And he's still marvelous. It's, it's, it's oh. like a second oh. right? Oh, oh, it's the beauty of it. <laughs> but <laughs> after, after a week ashore, say a week, a ten days, and you go. Then you want them to go. I think what it is with that thing is that we develop our independence. Like when they're fishing, we become the bosses of everything. <laughs> right. We have to make decisions for better or for worse. We have fathers and mothers to our children. We have to run the house by ourselves. And like in me, I'm so sure that sometimes I want to put a nail and I'm waiting for Johnny to come on because I never reached the wall. And they, they themselves will see are independent, right? So then when we come, they come home, it's beautiful. I love that. But then once they stay on for a lot, they start missing their sea and their, okay. their thing. I and they, they start get getting they edgy. Yeah. Yeah. And then is the out. time when we say, yeah. just, uh, you know, get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's good to have your own time. I think we've both gotten used to that, that you need your own time. Because it's not good in a time of a crisis or an accident or when something happens, because there's no way to get directly in touch with them. You know, that happened last year. His sister was killed in a car accident, and Coast Guard, nothing could locate him. We finally had to wait for the boat to come in. So, I mean, that's, that's hard when he's out fishing, if anything happens, or you have to wait. The, the minute he's in, she's, she's out the door with him. You know, there's, she doesn't forget him at all. She's been like that since she was tiny anyway. She was a few weeks old when he was taken into the boat with him. She was like a toy, I think, you know. He just happened to call home to say that he was coming home, and the first thing he does is ask for me. My mother says, she's not home. She's at the hospital. You have a daughter, you know? <laughs> and the luckiest thing was that he only called when they were about two hours away from home. So it didn't take him that long <laughs> to come home. <laughs> but if he had called, 38 hours when they started, you know, that trip was going to be for him forever. And uh, by the time I was told that he already called and he knew the news, he was already at the hospital and just left the boat <laughs> and ran, you know. And um, I felt so ugly. I was alone and when it happened. And, and I just, for one moment, I thought of him and, you know, I had not seen him for eight days. And I was afraid if anything were to happen, I just, you know, just had memory. That, and these are the, the things that we have to face, really, being fishermen's wife. Like when Jerry graduated from St. John's Prep, yeah. and Peter wouldn't cut his trip shop. For one thing, he was so in debt, he felt like, oh, I'm not going to bring the boat in. If it happens, okay. Well, he wasn't here for Jerry's graduation, and I think he regretted it sure. all his life. Goodness, a lot. Yeah, and he yeah. felt so bad about it. He says, here's a milestone in our life. We worked so hard to put this kid through school, and I had to miss it. Oh, no. So I when he graduated know. from college, he made sure, darn sure, that he was in.
was just thinking about the time I was in England on the LSD. And I went ashore in Liberty, and I see these big crabs ashore. I said, gee, I told a guy, where'd you get these crabs? He said, on the harbor. So I ran back, and ran aboard the boat, made a, aboard the ship, and I made a little net. I put some bacon in there, and threw it overboard. After about a half hour, there's about four or five of them big crabs. The gang's all looking at me, you know, most of them. What are you doing? Crabs. You ever eaten any crabs? Never seen them before, some of these guys from the hills. So I says, hey, you boil these up. They're sweet, delicious. So I boiled them. I says, let me taste it. So I taste it. Gee, they are good. The other guy, let me taste it. Everyone start tasting them, and I'm looking. The four crabs, they ate them. I says, gee, any Christmas. You lost a good thing. I guess I threw the bait overboard again, pulled it up. Another five, six grabs. Boil them up, same thing. Everybody, let me taste it. The first the OD come, let me taste it. He tasted, it. gee, they're delicious. I said, hey, I ain't gonna get any crabs. I better figure something out. So the next batch I got, when I boiled them, they're all sitting around ready to start eating. I said, hey, boys, you know why these crabs are so big? I said, why? I said, you know all the dead bodies, all these bombs that have been dropping over here, planes falling? Well, the crabs eat on these bodies. Everybody dropped yeah, them. All After that, as, they were all mine. I kept eating them very steady. And no one else bothered me with the crabs. They didn't want no more. It just brought back memories. We got so much fog that every time I look out the window, I think back, you know, the time you lost the boat. My phone was ringing early in the morning, you know, I'd go to answer it, there was nobody on the phone. would ring again, I'd go to answer it, no one on the phone. But my grandmother made a mistake and she said my name, you know, and then she hung up. I ran to the window and I saw the fog and I thought something happened, surely something happened. And I called my sister and sure enough, the boat had gone down. Pete was gone eight days, and we had a lot of fog rolling in, and uh, I was really starting to worry. I said, God, where is he? I haven't heard anything, you know. So one morning, Pete calls up. It was after the seventh day. He calls up, and he says, hey, hon, take the chair away from the door so I can come in. <laughs> I said, oh, that sounded so good to me. <laughs> I think that's quite a bit fun. It actually did. Yeah, yeah well, fog is. And you know, you think that he know. lost a human being. He was. I have never seen him so so upset, so grieved. The Saint Joseph. I think the Saint Joseph the first. Yeah. Be gone. I ain't got no education to go anyplace else anyways, for one thing. My education is fishing. That's it. I can't go to school now. I'm too old for that. When I was young, I couldn't go to school. I wanted to. I had no opportunity. If I had, I would have went. Owned the boat and I went, that's all. We all did, all in the family. Well, how'd you end up going cook? Just done it, that's all. I don't know. You say you don't like it, but all the time. I don't like it. Oh, well, how come I you still go? go. I don't know. The guy asked me to go and I go. I'm still at it. I'm gonna keep at it, yes. I don't know. <laughs> He's had to fire me, I suppose. I'd rather be down the fish hole than do it, go behind that stove. It's hot behind the stove. It's cool down the hole. You ain't kidding.
What do you think about fishing? I think about it probably the same thing you do. It's just a way of life, though. They've got to do it. Why? You well, I... Well, you got a better education than I got. Well, I went to work for a cat, I was a caterpillar, and then I last about a year, and then I come back fishing. Money was there. I don't know. The money's there, but it's just you don't like to punch the time clock, I guess. I don't know about freedom so much as just you're off. You don't have to go in at eight o'clock in the morning every day. I'll stop. Go uh, work for Caterpillar a couple of times. Since I've been with Pete, I went to Arizona once, worked there. And then I went to Florida once, worked there, and always come back here. Did you hear about that story? We was working on deck. We had about 20,000 of fish on deck. So we started cleaning them, and, they, and uh, Cosmo says, uh, we're going to stop the engine for a while. So he told me to go down the engine room and help the engineer. I said, all right. So I went down. For three and a half hours, I was doing something. I don't know. I don't know nothing about engines. So all of a sudden, it was all done. He started the engine up. Then he stopped it. I said, what are you doing, Joe? You know? He said, you see the smoke come out there? I said, no, I didn't see no smoke. He started up again. All of a sudden, it blew up. Badoosh. Knocked me down. I think the first thing I said was, Ma, I said, it's all over. He says, hurry up, get out, it's gonna blow up again. So I ran for the ladder. I grabbed the ladder like that, and he was in back, and all of a sudden it blew up. Didn't even climb up the ladder, it just blew us out. Blew the whole turtle back off. I ran forward and got my life as well. I left all my money, everything, in the bunk. Kicked off my boots, I ran on deck, I grabbed a big checkerboard. <laughs> I was going over the side in March. <laughs> That's how soon the whole boat was down in the water like that. And I heard Cosmo say, uh, Charlie the Bowl, we blew up. We sell west of the fleet. And all the lights went out. He says, get the dories. So I ran up. Cut the lines, one dory went away. I jumped from the top of the pile, I was in the dory. Started filling up with water. I was throwing bushels, everything was all full of junk. Tony the tuna didn't want to leave the boat, he was crying. He had one, one foot over the rail. He said, my home, I don't want to leave, I'm scared. I said, and the boat was coming down. He was hitting us, I thought it was going to tip us over. He said, if you don't get off, I said, I'm going to leave you here. No, no, so he wouldn't get off, so we pulled his leg, he fell in the dory. Then we rolled away, and the boat was all on fire. And I said, this is it. He says, I had it. And when I was sitting in the dory, with a T-shirt on, bare pants, in the middle of March, all iced up, rolling, trying to save my life. Every time we come out, we don't know if we're coming back again. This is a life, uh, what are we gonna do? I don't know. The only thing I know, my wife don't want me to go. All the time uh, I go, maybe learn something new. I can't see a, you know, learn it, you know. You know what I mean? The time I come home, she's, she's doing something different. I like to be around to see her, you know, do them things. I can't see my kids grow up. See my kid play baseball or anything, you know? I gotta be out here. Hey, just like you, never see my kids grow up. I did see my one, uh, my son graduate from college. That's it. Family's all grown up. Same thing happened to my grandchildren now. No graduation, no confirmation. of people who go to sea, possibly three out of five, the sea throws back on land. They're not that type of person. Those people who stay at sea form a distrust for the land people. Traditionally, 
they've had a hard time dealing with them. Traditionally, the sailor winds up with none of his pay in his pocket when he comes back to the vessel. People who go to sea have not had the time, the inclination, whatever you want to call it, to deal with people on land very well. And so that's why they make this distinction about land people and, and, and sea people. fish at all or uh, I see you got mostly uh, perch on the on the trip. You want me to diversify yeah. over? You want me to diversify, so I'll go for redfish. Well one day one day for round fish and, and the rest for redfish. At least diversify you mean you can't catch more of uh Hattican cut? No 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 four hundred pounds if I go for redfish. Okay. Four hundred pounds. Well you got more than four hundred pounds here. Yeah. Oh, one day in Georgia. Oh I see one day in Georgia. Yeah. Well, we're in the auction room in New Bedford, uh, where all the fish and scallops are sold every day, five days a week. <laughs> and what happens here is that early in the morning, the boats come in. Either the skipper or the mate from the vessel will come in here, put his hail on the board. Then at the time of the auction, the processors, the primary buyers will come in and bid on the different species of fish. <laughs> The uh, increments of bidding are 10 cents per pound for each different species of fish that's there. The prices vary according to demand that uh, whoever wants the fish and how much of it they do want. Last year, uh, $54 million worth of fish and scallops were sold. Here. I'm Brian Vesey, Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of GoldenEye Seafoods. GoldenEye Seafoods was founded by Steve Bogus in 1970 in Chatham, Massachusetts to bring some fresh fish and fillets and scallops to the major Boston restaurants. People are now eating at the rate of about 13 pounds per capita consumption. That's a lot of fish. Presently, about 85% of all fillets in the United States um, that we eat and consume are brought in by foreigners. Primarily everything that McDonald's and most of the fast food chains all import 100% uh, of their product from Norway, Iceland, Denmark, and Canada. We got the imports coming in and uh, there's no way that we can compete with them and pay last year's prices. So we have to pay uh, a lesser price in order to con try to compete. If the amount of fish available continues, uh, then we certainly will take a bigger place in world fisheries, and this is what we're pointing for. We want to get a bigger piece of the action of supplying the need of fishery products in the United States. On a whole cod fish that, say, we'll pay uh, 40 cents a pound for in the whole fish, we only get 40% yield. 60% of that codfish is head and bones and skin. So that ends up as a dollar material cost. 
and it costs us about 50 cents a pound to process it. So we charge supermarkets and other companies a dollar fifty. Now they have marketing costs to get it into the case and uh, to operate, and that's probably another twenty cents. So it ends up a codfish costing a dollar fifty, dollar seventy uh, in a fillet. Now we probably out of that will make a nickel. The supermarket they're known to be one percent, um, so they make another nickel out of it. And that's about it. The fisherman, out of the 40 cents per pound that he receives, probably half of that is labor and fuel and payments on the boat. So he may make, at most, 20 cents a pound. So there's no one's profiteering uh, in any way, shape, or form. What we all want to do is get more volume and make our total dollars bigger. If it was had, it would be a lot better. Can't bring it now. Then it's illegal. You go to jail? <laughs> no, I don't want you to do that. That's <laughs> the place in Florida you business. This is starting to sound a little more interesting, isn't it? I better believe it. Give me two more years, mother. I uh, tell you, I throw this thing all down the drain. Throw the boat. You want to come? <laughs> well, I tell you, if it keeps up this way, I'm going to be looking for Florida myself. Go to bedroom. Depression. It's uh, uh, how do you say Inflation. It? Inflation. It's the same thing as uh, depression. It's, it's not no. the same thing. Almost. I made thirty-two hundred dollars last trip with Stubby, right? You know how much I bought? Sixteen hundred dollars. What's that? Yeah, they took more money, almost as half. Thank you, Governor. The Fisheries Conservation and Management Act of 1976, so-called 200-mile bill, was. Uh, uh, enacted by Congress for two principal reasons. One, there was an appraisal from uh, the domestic fishermen of the United States that the foreign harvest, particularly off our coast in the, in the western North Atlantic, uh, was seriously impacting their stocks. They wanted foreign fishing reduced. The overriding emergency which we faced in the years we were trying to enact the legislation was the presence of the foreign fleets out there who were literally raping the resource. The, Eastern Bloc countries, the Soviets, the Japanese, with the factory trawlers, with total disregard for any semblance of conservation tactics, were simply sweeping, vacuuming the ocean floor. No question about it. Uh, the, the foreign fishing activity in 1965 and 66, I believe, uh, reduced uh, perhaps the largest year class of haddock, the most successful year of haddock spawning that was ever observed in a matter of a few years to, uh, well, the, the haddock resource was reduced to very low levels, unprecedentedly low levels. We're enormously blessed uh, in the United States with having a, a, an extraordinary uh, amount of, of a resource, and basic resource. We have an important responsibility to the people of this country, and I think uh, to the people of the world, to preserve what effectively is one quarter uh, of the world's fishing grounds. This myth of the inexhaustible sea, which we've always worked on, goes back to the first people that came off our shores and spoke about the tremendous abundance of salmon and clams and other fin fish that were here. It was there, but the precept is, it, it has always been that man could could fish without harming this resource. And we just know that isn't true any longer. It, it can be harmed, and management is one of the things that many fishermen recognize is needed, and certainly in other parts of the world there are some catastrophic of, of resource disasters that have occurred because management has not been implied. Well, it was our fault. We wanted the 200-mile limit. We wanted help. We wanted help. They killed Instead it. Instead of helping us, they killed us. One of the problems, of course, which has come along with it, is that the devastation of those stocks had been so severe that it was necessary to impose quotas even on American fishing in the absence of any foreign fishing. So they also built into the, the, to the new act uh, management authority to control domestic fisheries. What bothers me, what, what hurts is 
that to have the, the fisherman uh, presented as a raper of the resource, as a guy who is just out there to uh, never mind tomorrow, to make as much money as he can today in that, uh, certainly uh, in, in all hunting, there are, there are those who, who take this approach. But I don't think that, uh, I think that, that there is a misrepresentation there, and I think that, well, just for me, I, I just can't, I, I hope that the fishery will stay in a mode that there is the least interference possible from all kinds of agencies, land people, call them what you want to, that we are allowed to operate in the, in the freest way possible. And I think that the people who, who just want to become involved, who want to manage, who naturally want to manage everything in sight, uh, are, uh, have gotten a little bit out of hand. My name is Dick Siemens, and I'm with the Fisheries Management Division of the National Marine Fisheries Service in Gloucester. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to discuss the dealer and vessel logbook report forms. The basic purpose of the logbook is to collect information for scientific and statistical purposes. It's very important to the management of the resources. This logbook you're about to hand out here the other one that you've got out in force now, presently you're pinching people with it. And right on the face of it, it says for biological purposes only. Mm -hmm. And what, th what, what makes us uh, a little leery is exactly that. Is this one supposed to do the same thing? Biological purposes, and then you wind up pinching us for it. We have a problem. Uh, we have this piece of information here. It's within the agency. It's available. Uh, if people are violating the law, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know, to, to say, okay, we're going to ignore this piece of information that the agency's got. Uh, if an individual is breaking the law and we have evidence that shows it, we ought to be able to use it to, to prosecute someone. You have a certain leeway with regulation. And in this particular case... If you feel like it, you can enforce it, is what you're saying. If you don't feel like it, you won't. All I'm saying to you is, you will not be you will not be in violation if you report this Well, and it's in violation now. How can you just wipe it clean and say no? That's all right now. No, you're not in violation now, are you? There's no Do you know Do you know of anyone that's been cited for a violation of? Yes, sir. The fellow was cited last fall with a dumping codfish back over by the coast guard. They gaffed him up, come aboard his boat, and rode him out. What, what was the result of the citation? I don't know. He was written up and he was cited, so that must be an enforcement of the law. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're not, they're, they haven't been nitpicking ever. There are other things in addition to civil penalties that we can do under the law. Uh, we can be seizing fish, and um, we may well be seizing fish and the proceeds from the sales of fish having a, a direct economic hit on the transaction. So that will be a disincentive to, you know, crews don't want to go out and, and work their backs off pulling fish on board that the government's just going to take and they're not going to get paid for. It. We're, going to, we're going to be doing a lot more of that. Um, we hope we never have to, but, you know, the law gives us the authority to seize vessels. And if we have particular cases where it's obvious that that's the kind of deterrent you have to have, to get an individual to comply, we're willing to do that. Um, do you, there are a range, there are a range of enforcement options that we have, and we intend to, to go as far with them as we have to to make the system work. Penny, it's not just Sam, it's me, it's a lot of us. I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to give up the boat. I'm, that's the way I feel. The government took over and that's it. The strip of uh, the man came down, the government guy comes down, wants a log. I said, that's it, forget it. I said, I'll, I'll see you next trip, bring a citation now because I ain't signing no law. You're not going to fill it? No way. 
They tell me where to go fishing, when not to go fishing, where to go fishing, what to bring in. Are any of the other boys going to fill their logs? Or what's going to... How about the big boys, huh? Mm. In Virginia, they had a big bonfire in Virginia and burned all the log book. There's only a select few here in Gloucester that are, that are throwing them in. Small boys ain't throwing them in. Well, I think you men should all unite. You know, they can't really hurt all of you. If they all would, but they're not. Me, I'm not going to do it. Well, that's, I don't know, it's a hard situation, really. Fisheries managers for years have told me you've got to have the majority of the fishermen with you. They're just the nature of the beast. You can't go out and come down with more and more punitive measures and finally get the fishermen to the point where you've got them obeying the law if they don't believe in the management system that they're under. That's our problem. Now, I find it difficult when you go to fisheries managers and they say to you, we know that if we don't have the fishermen with us, we can't make it. You say, all right, what is the answer? They say, more enforcement. The two don't go together. Two people are enforcing these stupid rules. They ought to demolish the whole New England Regional Council. Forget about it. I'll go along with well. that. That's no, I, why I, nobody goes to New England you know, Regional Council meetings. You said that. that the New England Regional Council job. knew about these books coming out. I don't go to the meetings. I feel repetitious. Every time I go there, I say the same thing over and over. We did all we could in drafting the bill to make sure that the, those decisions which would affect the fishermen so much were not made by some faceless bureaucrat in Washington or even by somebody in the state capitol but were made regionally by management councils composed of people who represented the fishing industry itself. So the decisions uh, are decisions which have been made uh, based in large part upon the input from the fishermen themselves. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of introductions at the beginning of the meeting. Unfortunately, here in New England, I think we inherited the most difficult of all the situations uh, that faced the regional councils, the eight of which were created around the country as a result of that foreign overfishing. And the job inherited by the New England Management Council is, is an extremely difficult one. I think they have done well as they have wrestled with it initially. Uh, the fishermen are still and will for some time, I suspect, be uh, bridling under various kinds of restrictions. Mr. Dykstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that uh, it, it might be useful if we, if we get a, a, a little more complete report of, uh, of what has happened so far at the informational meetings, uh, if there is anyone who can make a report. I, th I think it is unfortunate that no record is being kept because I think that the <coughs> fishermen attending uh, more than ever feel that, uh, that the, the meetings are, are simply a formality and, and uh, a waste of time. But at least we, the, the council could get some feel if we could get some kind of, of a report on that. Uh, I'm concerned because I think that if a logbook system is indeed the best way to go, that it's being so seriously set back by the procedure that's being followed. Uh, the fishermen are up in arms, uh, I don't, I, no question about it. Uh, they they uh, are, are seriously objecting, and they're, they're trying to find ways to, uh, to avoid the logbook. And I think to say that there is authority to do this, so we decided to do it this way, is, uh, is a little bit high-handed, and that the fishermen feel this way. Mr. Chairman, uh, we've been over uh, a considerable amount of this ground on the, on the development of the logbooks, uh, and the council's role, and the public's role, and the fishermen's role in, in the development of the logbooks. Both of the previous speakers have implied that National Marine Fishery Service has some specific bias in trying to play down the, the negative reports that come out of these, these informational meetings. And that's just not true. I resent the comment, in fact, that, that we would go to public hearings with some preconceived commitment to logbooks. We do have logbooks printed. They are out, and they'll, they'll be used. But I do believe that the, the conservative approach that was taken, and I think most people are coming to this now, the conservative approach that was originally taken to management of groundfish 
has been far more detrimental than if we had taken a much more liberal approach and made le much less interference. And I don't think there's any question. The, 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 the social and economic disruption has, has been massive, and it's been wrong. Well, he said the brackets were worn out, though. He said you might get a summer Huh? Oh, he's laughing. Huh? Yeah, he's no, no, I ain't the idea of that. But what's causing all this damage? All right, you go over humps. You, you, you might lose a belly or something. No, wings. It's the wings, the wings. See the mesh? The mesh? This mesh here? Look at it. Now look, get that. Pull it. You see that on the wall? Pull it. You guys see that on the wall. That's now quite a difference. Now you see the difference. Look. Yeah. Put the ball together. See that mesh there? And this mesh? See how much difference there is over here? Yeah. But now, take your hand off. See now, dude, from there to there. Now you get all these meshes. Count them. It's pulling You know out. how long? There'll be about over two or three feet of slack, which will pull the square down. Yeah. And that's why we're making the damage. Hey, Carl, where you been? Doing your thing. <laughs> Get what you want it anyway. Uh, I hope you. so. Thank you. Pete, this wing is the same as this match. Same size. You know what? He gave it us here. This is wrong. It's a half inch difference. It's a half inch difference. It's got to be pulling your net down. But this here is the same now. The top one is the same as the square. So it might help a little. Because the top and the top. Wing, don't be yeah, I ain't gonna buy no more twine. That's it. <laughs> yeah, what I got, I'm gonna use. That's what we figured. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I know what you buy, you gotta use. Uh, it's the damage we're making, and we're losing fish at the same time. That's, I told you, stop and he ain't gonna do oh, it anymore. Anyway. That's it. I ain't buying no more. Yeah, but look at how much fish you're losing. It's it's a business. It's an industry, and it's now a regulated industry. And I think what we're going to find, uh, along with many other industries, is that uh, the efficient, the productive, uh, the profit-making uh, entrepreneurs are going to stay in. And the ones who are on the margin or on the wrong side of the margin uh, are not going to be able to do that. And uh, that's business. That's that's the way the American economic system works. No, I told him, I said, if we get three bags of fish, we're supposed to get five? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because really? oh, yeah. your head rope was falling down. I keep telling you that. That's right. Your head's been falling down. Yeah, I know. <laughs> nah. Well, I think that the cat has been skipper for all his life. Yeah. You know and what he says? And if he thinks... Let me do my thing. Let me do my thing. Let me do my do your and thing. And if he thinks there's something wrong, you don't think he's going to fix and it? Captain, you've been doing your yeah. thing. You've been keeping up good. Right, right. Trim. We'll never forget about well, Mendes. Right. We'll right. never you're forget about Mendes. You take care of the cooking. That's right. Well, I'll take you the engine. All right. And let me do my thing. That's right. Sometimes it comes out all right. If it comes out right, I'm a hero. If it comes out wrong, I'm a bum. I don't foresee the day when the general independent spirit one associates with American fishermen will, will ever disappear. It's not necessarily fun going out there on the big ocean and fishing. We have to. It's a way of life, and they happen to like it, and they are rugged. And it will always be that way. Yeah, there's a song that. Yes, they get the song that, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I think the problem that we're trying to deal with now is, is helping people to the extent it's our responsibility to help, helping people to develop a general management philosophy which retains as much of this as possible. And that's the biggest problem of all. I don't know what the magic answer is. I don't think there's any question, but as long as it's in the interest of the American people to maintain a stock like the Haddock, that there will be limits of some sort or another. But the fact that there will be limits of some description or another doesn't necessarily guarantee that the way of life has to change in total. I don't think it can change in total and, and we continue to have a fishery because it requires a kind of a guy who's dedicated to that kind of life who is rugged and independent and everything else and by God we'd better work out management plans that retain those qualities nobody could beat me I had to be the best I was. For the age that I was when I first died, I was pretty good. Not bragging on it, but it was pretty good. How long have you been fishing, Pete? And I've been at it a long time, Tommy. 
45 years. It's been a long haul. You get tired. You get tired of fighting. Now you're starting to fight the government with quotas and all that crap. The old days you ran up, cut your fish, fought hard weather, go where you want to go. Now they tell you where to go, what to bring in. If you cheat, you get a fine, you go to jail. Ah. I don't need her no more. As New Hampshire grows, our lives become more complex. What happens in Concord affects those of us who live in Keene. What happens in the seacoast affects us in Nashua. Channel 11 helps us to understand these complexities. It brings us together to share our triumphs, our sorrows, and our traditions. Channel 11 is the only New Hampshire television station that reaches the North Country. And with its remote television unit, it takes us to places that belong to us all. Channel 11 also brings elected officials into our homes, keeps us informed on New Hampshire businesses, and showcases our young people. As New Hampshire grows, Channel 11 is bringing us all together. Wherever you live in New Hampshire, won't you help ensure the continuation of this vital state resource? Help it meet its year-end goal. Send your check for $35, $60 or more to this address today. There are powerful political forces in America who want you to quit smoking. It is the single largest preventable cause of death in our country. There are equally powerful forces who would rather you didn't. This is the first time in American history that you have a serious proposal to entirely censor the speech of a legal industry. Showdown on Tobacco Road may not help you quit, but it will make you think. Thursday night at 10 on Channel 11. Shelter from radiation. How much is enough? That question's on the table at this week's evacuation hearings before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We take you there on this week's 